All right, check this out. Hey Siri, what is the capital of Liechtenstein? Vardut is the capital of Liechtenstein. All right, now. I'm not here to teach about the capital of Liechtenstein, but you all may remember, it wasn't always that easy to find that out, right? Back in the day, for some of you in the ancient days, the days gone by, we could not say, hey Siri, or Alexa, or whatever these things are that are listening to us all the time and doing whatever, we couldn't say to those things or type into Google, what is this thing? What we had to do is they had these things we made out of trees, and they'd make paper out of them, and they were called books. And we would have to get those books, and if we wanted to know something, we had to open up those books and find it. And it was actually very difficult and time-consuming to do that. And if you wanted to know something and you didn't happen to have the book, you just didn't get to know it. You just didn't get to know that thing. You would have to go to a place called a library. It was a magical place. had <laughs> lots of those paper books in it. And you'd have to go, and then you'd go to the library and Google what's called the Dewey Decimal System. So you go up, and there's a big thing, and you pull out the drawer, and then you look for a thing, and it would give you this weird number, and then you have to go find that address, and you find the book, and then you had to read the book. So it was a little bit more time intensive than, hey, Siri, which is probably going to turn my phone on. Don't, no, don't listen to me, Siri. Go away. All right. Okay, so... That's how it was, right? It was a little bit different. If you had an argument with your buddy about what the capital of Liechtenstein was, you couldn't just go to Google. You had to either go, you either had the, the Funk and Wagnalls or the World Book or the Britannica. Those are the encyclopedias that you know, mom bought from the door-to-door -door encyclopedia salesman. And that would be in your thing. And you go somewhere and you look up Liechtenstein, you find the capital. Or maybe you had a globe, right? And you go on the globe and with a magnifying glass, find Liechtenstein and find what the capital was. It was work. It was different. It took effort. It took diligence. We used almanacs. I don't know how many of you remember almanacs, but that we used those for all kinds of facts. Encyclopedias, newspapers, and magazines. And, and back then, newspapers and magazines were actually paper. They weren't on your phone like they are now. I admit it's more convenient, but you know, it was harder for us. And that was after walking to school uphill both ways in the snow. So there's a lot that we had to, had to do, kids. Um, Occasionally, back then, you may have had a passion to find something out, right? You wanted to know something. And so, you would search. You would search, and you would take the time and the effort and go and seek, and you'd keep on seeking and seeking until you found the information that you wanted, right? If you were in, uh, in college or, or like me in law school and that type of thing, and you wanted to write a paper, it might take you a couple months just to get the interlibrary loan books to come in so you could even start doing your research. It was a lot of work. It was a lot of work. Nowadays, I notice the one thing where I really see that happening because everything else seems to be online, and this is online too, but the one thing where I see people like seeking and spending lots of time is this genealogy research stuff. I've seen a lot of this work, and I got caught up in it for about a week one time. I was like, free trial? Oh, I need to know who my 27th great-grandfather is. I've always wondered. And so you go in, and you can do that. You can just spend hours and hours and hours and hours and hours looking through to find all your ancestors hundreds and hundreds of years back. And people go, and they want to make this, they get this huge family tree. And out here in the Northwest, I've noticed those family trees are nice. They have these big branches and whatever. When I was in Tennessee in the South, they were a little straighter up and down, more of a... <laughs> Family poll is really what it was. Um, Randy's not here this time, so we can say what we want. But you can get lost doing all that searching, right? Because you get pa people get passionate about it. My grandmother like did the, all of it and came and gave us the thing, and I haven't even read it yet to know who I'm related to. Although, apparently, did you know I'm related to Henry VIII and Abraham Lincoln? You didn't know that because it's not true. I'm not related to anybody. <laughs> I'm related to Noah and Adam, and so are you. That's about as much as I'm worried about at this point. Um, people are diligent and dedicated to seeking out the things that they want. If they want information, they'll be in their passion about it. They'll be diligent and dedicated to seek that information out. If they want a thing, they'll be diligent and dedicated to seek out that thing. They'll go and get it. Persistent seeking is the mark of a person of passion. Okay? Persistent seeking is the mark of a person of passion. There's a lot of P's in that sentence, so don't try to say it fast. It is. If somebody is passionate, you will be able to see that because they're a persistent seeker after whatever it is that they're passionate about. Now, we've been in a study called Right Side Up. We've been going through in, in the scripture Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. 
And what Jesus has constantly been doing is he's been showing us this is what the world looks like. This is what culture looks like, and it's upside down. And I'm going to show you what the kingdom life looks like, and it's right side up. So Jesus is constantly telling us, showing us what it looks like to be a Christ follower, what it looks like for the kingdom of heaven, for the kingdom life. And it's always upside down to whatever the world is all about. And so we've been going through that. We've been, it starts in Matthew chapter five. It ends at the end of chapter seven. We're all the way to chapter seven now. And we're going to get into it. We're going to do one part is going to be kind of a finish from last week. And the next part is going to be kind of the next section. So let's start with, if you have your Bible, Let's, uh, let's get that out, chapter 7 of Matthew. If not, it'll be on the screen, or you can use your phone, or whatever you want to do. But let's get into the word here. You remember last week, we talked about judgment, that really famous verse, judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you use, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will measure back to you, and it goes on to the whole speck in the eye and the plank and all that stuff, okay? Then after that, there's a verse that we're going to read to kind of wrap up what was going on there. And what it does is that verse tempers this part before. It, 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 it takes it and softens the do not judge and shows us what we talked about last week, which is Jesus is clearly not saying you can't judge anybody about anything at any time. He's talking about condemnation. He's talking about that kind of thing. But discernment is something you have to have. And so this is what it says. It says, this is verse 6. Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine. That's pigs lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you in pieces. It's pretty harsh. It's a pretty harsh thing to say, or it seems like it. Uh, D.A. Carson mentions in his book on the Sermon on the Mount that while this is a warning against having no judgment, right? So first he says, don't judge, and he's talking about condemnation and harshness and judging the hearts that you don't know and so on. This is a warning against not having any judgment. But he also mentions, Carson mentions, that this is one verse on being careful to make sure you do do some judging, and there were five verses on making sure that you don't judge too much. So I'm guessing that Jesus knows that generally for most of us, our temptation is over judging, not under judging, right? And so uh, we're going to hit, last week it took us about an hour to get through those five verses. We're only going to take about a fifth of that to get through this one. I just want you to understand what Christ is talking about. It's important that we heed the warnings that Christ gives us. It's important. So we need to walk through what's going on in this passage. Jesus is talking about pearls. Don't cast your pearls before swine. He's using a metaphor. And in the metaphor, pearls are the word of God, right? Relationship with Jesus, his word. That's what truth. Pearls are eternal, significant truth. But why pearls? Why pearls? Well, let me tell you why pearls. You have to understand who he was talking to and what was going on at the time to understand what's going on in Scripture. Now, pearls are fairly common. We have pearls. We have cultured pearls. And what that means is we also have just totally fake pearls. You can buy some of those. $5, is that what they are? We've got the $5 jewelry girls. You can watch that. I'm sure you can get some of that. Hey, it looks good. Uh, you know, but they have, they have fake pearls, and then they have cultured pearls, which are basically people get the oysters and they put something inside the oyster so that it will form a pearl as opposed to just it happening in the, in the sea, right? Normally what happens is an oyster gets some sand or gets something in it and it makes this pearl. And of course, oysters are down there and you got to go get them out and then you get these pearls. So natural pearls are actually very rare. They say there are very few of them left in the world to even go get. Culture pearls are very common and relatively inexpensive. So a lot of you probably have pearls. Dave, probably have, you can wear them next week. Um, some, of, some people have pearls, right? And they're not incredibly expensive. But at this time, at this time in the first century, pearls were the most valuable jewels. The most valuable in the world. One of the reasons for that is if you have to go down and get a, an oyster and you don't have a scuba tank, it's really hard because you have to hold your breath for a long time, right? So it was very difficult to harvest these oysters to get these pearls. So there were a lot fewer of them, and they were worth a lot of money. In fact, uh, we hear from Fred Ward, who wrote an article on pearls through the ages, that Rome's pearl craze reached its zenith, the highest point, during the first century B.C., So the century before Jesus is doing his ministry, the very highest point of people just being all about pearls was going on. So it was a very culturally, when you talked about pearls, you were talking about something incredibly, incredibly valuable. There was a queen in Egypt who had a pair of pearl earrings, okay? Two pearls. 
And I'm guessing they were decent sized pearls, but there are two pearls. And in, in the history that's written about this, it said that those two pearls were worth 1,875,000 ounces of fine silver. Okay? Today, that would be $34,125,000 for two pearls. Big pearls, but two pearls. $34 million. So what does that tell us about what Jesus is saying about the word of God? He is saying that there is nothing more valuable than Jesus and his word, than truth. Nothing. Right? Pearls were the most valuable. That's the metaphor he uses. There's not something more valuable that he could talk about. So the most valuable is what the word of God is. It is the most valuable thing you will ever encounter is Jesus, is God, and his word. It is the most valuable thing. So he's saying, be careful with it. Don't just toss it out wherever. It's something to keep in mind every time that you have Bible reading to do. We have this Bible reading through the year thing. I hope a lot of you are doing that. Some of us, including me, we miss some days, and it's like, oh, well, I got to get to that. You know? But we probably didn't miss a day of you watching a show on Netflix or doing whatever else, but we do miss reading the Bible, and it's so backwards. It's so upside down because Jesus has told us that what's here are pearls, are the most valuable thing in the universe, and we ignore it sometimes. We don't want to read it. It's hard. It's difficult. Yeah, so is diving for pearls. And he's saying, you got to go after those things. you got to go after what's true. you got to go after the eternally valuable, right? When it's time to come to church on Sunday morning, you're thinking about, do I want to sleep in or do I want to make it? Now, you're the 11 o'clock service, so you got to hit a little harder with this. Nine o'clock, they usually come because they're, you know, they get up early. Do I want to come to church or not? Well, how many pearls are you going to get laying in your bed? Probably not many. If you have oysters in your bed, that's weird. So <laughs> you're probably not going to get many pearls at home. You've got to decide what your life is going to look like and what you're going to value. Right? When it's time to go to life group and it's like, man, it's been a hard day of work. Worked eight hours, worked 10 hours. If you're a millennial, worked four hours. And you, <laughs> kidding. I'm kidding. Kidding. If you're a teacher, it was probably vacation time, so I, you know. Sorry, Glenn. Um, so you've worked, right? You're tired. We know what it's like to do a hard day of work. I work, you know, one day a week on Sundays, and I can get tired of doing that. So we, we get tired, and we're thinking, do I want to go to life groups tonight or do I want to stay home? Well, you worked however many hours for a few dollars that are going to pass away. They're going to the bills. They're going to whatever. And, and yet you could go to life group and have fellowship with other believers of the body of Christ and study his word, which is eternally valuable and significant above everything. If you're going to spend the hours at work, you probably should put the couple hours into life group once a week, right? We've got to think about those things. We've got to think about the values of the kingdom that Jesus has set for us to think about. And what he said is his word is pearls. His word, in their, in their language, is the most valuable thing in the world. The most valuable thing in the world. So every time that we pray, every time we seek him, every time we read the scripture, we're doing things that have eternal significance, that are eternally valuable. There is nothing more valuable than relationship with Jesus and knowing his word. But not everyone sees that. Not everyone understands that. What do dogs and pigs want? Food. They want food, right? Dogs and pigs want food. My dogs are what my wife calls food motivated. They're very food motivated, right? So if we're having a snack, we're sitting on the couch watching TV, I mean reading our Bibles and studying, <laughs> and we decide to have a snack, right? Our dogs are just, just I haven't been able to teach them not to beg. I haven't been able to teach them anything, okay? They, they, just, they do what they want. And they come over, and I'll be sitting there. They'll put their head right here on my leg and just start drooling, right? They just start drooling and drooling over the food that we've got because they're very food motivated. That's what animals like. They like food. Now, we like food too, but not like my dogs. My dogs will eat anything. They'll eat what's in the litter box, okay? They'll eat anything if they can get to it. That is not food. I've told them, but they, don't, they also don't understand English. So if I took a bag of pearls... We're eating this snack, and the dogs come up, I want food. And I said, no, 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 wait. Here's some pearls. And I threw the pearls out to them. Best case scenario, they sniff them. Maybe one of my dogs is kind of weird. He might lick one. 
They're going to figure out really quick it's not food. It doesn't taste good and whatever. And they're not going to value it at all. And of course, Jesus isn't talking about my dogs that are pets and that love me and that are probably just going to be like, whatever, I don't care about pearls, give me some beef jerky. We're talking about wild dogs. You can still see this all over the world, just like it was in Jerusalem in the first century. Go to Honduras, go to where we go in Tolonga, you'll see dogs everywhere. They're all over the place. They're just wild dogs. Nobody owns them. They're, they're mangy, they're gross, they're whatever, but they're just part of the life of the city. And if you mess with one of those dogs and, and they think you're going to give it food and you give it something that's not food, they might just tear you up, right? They can be dangerous. Not in Honduras. Nothing's dangerous. You should go. But <laughs> in other places, they might be dangerous. They might be dangerous, right? And Jesus is talking about that. Pigs and dogs. Pigs can be very dangerous too. I don't know how many of you have come up on a wild boar but supposedly they're not very safe. So if you are trying to give them something that they don't value, and instead they want something different for you, they want just food, temporal, something now, pleasure, and you give them something eternal that they don't understand, they don't value, they're not going to treat it with value, and it's almost possible that it would be dangerous for you. They might trample it and tear it up. Because dogs and pigs don't think about the eternally valuable. They don't. They only think about the temporal and pleasure. They just want food. Now, there are people like this too. There are people like this too. They would not know what to do with the word of God if if you gave it to them. They wouldn't value it one bit. And in fact, they'd probably ridicule, make fun of, right? Persecute and all kinds of other things, when you bring the truth to them. And if they're just going to mock and ridicule, then you are wasting your time and your pearls on a person that has no interest in them. may sound harsh that there are people that are like that, but Jesus is Jesus, and when he tells us that's true, it's true. There are people who are like that, that it would be unwise for you to spend your time giving them the truth of the Word of God. They simply don't value it. They simply don't value it. They're so selfish and pleasure motivated that they would act as animals would with pearls. They have no use for it. And they might just turn and tear you up. But we are called to witness to the whole world. And we are called to love our enemies. So clearly what Jesus is not saying here is that those people are people you should hate, despise, make fun of, right? Cast off? No, no, no. You should be, if they're your enemies, all the more you're supposed to love them and pray for them, okay? That's our call. And you're supposed to preach the gospel to the whole world. Because here's the thing. I've been that person. Some of you have been that person. D.A. Carson says this, many, if not most, thinking adults who have become sincere disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ begin this pilgrimage by balking, and not a few begin by mocking. Okay. Guys like C.S. Lewis, who was a renowned atheist, almost certainly a mocker of God, came to a glorious, saving, transformational relationship in Jesus Christ because people cared enough to continue to give him the word. And somebody in your life, if you're a Christ follower, has spoken the word of truth to you. And you may not have always received it well, but eventually it got through. So Jesus is not saying that this is most people. Or that we should just stop preaching the word. We should stop evangelizing. Stop trying to show people who Jesus is because nobody values it. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that occasionally you may may run into somebody where that's the case. And you'll have to use some discernment to do that. Of course, you're only going to get that discernment from the Holy Spirit. Most of you probably won't even run into that situation. And the reason you won't is because I think it's relatively rare. And most of us aren't spending enough time speaking the truth and speaking God's word to ever run into that situation because it's rare, right? Most people who are going to run into that are people who are preaching, teaching all the time. Now, occasionally they may run into something like these disciples did. The Pharisees became this way, right? And Paul's like, okay, you're out. I'm taking it to the Gentiles. You're not listening anymore. And there is a time and there's a place. Jesus talks about to his disciples, he says, look, when you go into a town and you're preaching the good news, If they won't have you and they won't listen, wipe the dust off your feet and take off. Those people are going to be under judgment. There is a time and a place where people will not listen. Now, there are times 
When your ministry, and every one of you has a ministry, and every one of you has a ministry of truth, you have what Christ has done in your life, you have what's in this word, he has equipped you to have a ministry. And there are times when your ministry will not be heard, but that does not mean that you stop loving people or that you stop praying for people. You pray that the Holy Spirit will draw them to himself, that you will have the opportunity one day to see them accept the truth of God's word. Most of us, if we've been in Christ for a long time, we have people who we've been praying for the whole time. Right? They might be our own children or our brothers or our sisters, parents, whoever it is, friends, co-workers, and we've been praying diligently for them, and they don't listen. They aren't interested. Keep praying. Keep praying. Remember this. Jesus was despised and rejected and killed. I feel like the popular version of Jesus, that people don't really pay attention to that part. Like Everyone knows there was a crucifixion, a resurrection, that kind of thing. But most people, when they think about Jesus... They think about the kind of Jesus is my homeboy Jesus, right? The guy in the robe who's like this and he's saying things and whatever. And everybody likes him and usually he's holding a sheep or something, right? And he's petting. You've seen the pictures, right? Jesus is the nice guy. Jesus is the good teacher. And everybody, of course, recognized that he was a good guy and a good teacher, right? And so there's all these people and crowds. What you don't remember, not you, but what society doesn't seem to remember or doesn't want to focus on is the fact that that's really not the story at all. He was rejected and despised by men. That's what he was. Remember uh, the people who he fed, the 5,000? They came and they were fed 5,000 people from five loaves and two fish. 5,000. That was just the men. There were a lot more people than that. That's just the men that they counted. So Jesus feeds 5,000 people. And this is what they say after, the, after this miracle. It says this, John 6, 14 through 15. Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, This is truly the prophet who has come into the world. Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. After this miracle is done, this is what the men are saying. This is the prophet. This is the Messiah. We need to go literally grab him and make him king right now. That's how jacked up they were about Jesus and this miracle that he had done. But here's the thing that's interesting. The next day, okay, that night, Jesus and his disciples, they go over, they go on a boat. Jesus walks on the water. You probably know the story. But they go over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, okay? And, the, and this is the next day. The next day, they're like, where's Jesus? Oh, he's over on the other side. They get in boats. They follow him. They seek him over to the other side because they're jacked up about who Jesus is, right? A bunch of people go and find him. They seek him out. And this is what Jesus says to them when they get there. John 6, 26 to 34. Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate. You seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. Then they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? They want something, right? Jesus answers them, really simple. Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. Therefore they said to him, what sign will you perform then? What? Did I not feed 5,000 people yesterday? What sign will you perform then, that we may see it and believe you? Prove it. And this is how they wanted to prove it, ready? What work will you do? Our fathers ate the manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. What did they want from him? More bread. We're hungry again. <laughs> He's like, I am God. I am the Messiah. In me, you can have eternal life. And they're like, that sounds great, but I'd like some bread. What will you do to prove it to us? You gave us bread yesterday. You know? They're like, what will you do? You know, I mean, Moses gave him bread, so I mean, I don't know if you want to give us more bread, but that's what, that's what they want, more bread. More bread. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. It sounds like they were coming around, but let's follow it a little further. What, are they, what were they seeking? They were seeking food. Food, the instant pleasure of the bread. And Jesus is like, don't focus on bread that perishes. Focus on the eternal, the valuable, the pearls. And they're snuffing around, <laughs> snuffing around the ground, right? For bread, missing the pearls. And he's trying to give them the pearls. 
Jesus tells them, he is the bread from heaven. He brings eternal life. He's come into the world to give life. They're like, give us bread. So Jesus starts talking to them about spiritual things, about bread. And he says, look, I'm the bread of life. My flesh is the bread, and it will be given for the life of the world. He tells them that. And they're like, what? What? And he goes on and he starts saying, if you're going to be part of me, you're going to eat my flesh and drink my blood. He's talking spiritually, right? We do this with communion. It's a spiritual thing. It's not cannibalism. But you know what they said? How are we going to eat his flesh? They're still thinking about eating. They're just they're eating. They, they, at the end of the day, what they're focused on is what Jesus can do for them right then and there. Feed me. Feed me perishing bread. They're not focused on the eternal things. Sorry about that. And so after this, Jesus teaches these things in the synagogue there at Capernaum. And what happens is, not lots of crowds, what happens is they leave. Many of the disciples who had been following him left and did not come back. Why? Because they didn't know Pearl if it bit him in the behind. They wanted something. They wanted bread. They wanted to make him king that he might conquer the Romans. They wanted stuff now, temporal, fading away type stuff. And when he said, no, 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 I'm going to give you that which is eternally valuable, they could not wrap their head around it. And they left. They walked away. They abandoned him because he was teaching eternal truths and they were hard, like getting pearls from an oyster. And they were just concerned with temporary pleasures. But here's the good part. They did not all leave. Not all of them left. This is what it says. Jesus is talking to the 12 right after this. John 6, 67 through 68. Then Jesus said to the 12, do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. So Peter, empowered by the Holy Spirit, could see a pearl for a pearl. And he recognized it. There will always be those who have no interest or understanding of the things of God. And there will always be those who God will reveal himself to and who will recognize a pearl for a pearl. And any of you who are in Christ have probably been both. Those who didn't understand it and those who finally did. Now, Peter was by no means perfect. But he knew, he knew that the words of life, real life, were in Christ. Now, how do we know? We're going to move on to this next section now. We've kind of hit this stuff on pearls and, and swine and whatever. This next section of, of the Sermon on the Mount we're going to move into. And, and it's going to tell us how do we know? How do we know who is the people who we should preach to and who are the people who we should not preach to? Who are the people who we should just live our lives the right way in front of and let the Holy Spirit sort them out? And who are the people who we should preach to? And how do we live all of this other stuff? How do we be poor in spirit and meek? All right? How do we be sexually pure? How do we do all these things that Jesus has been teaching us? How, how do we accomplish this? He's going to answer that in this next part. He's going to tell us that if we want to do those things, we have to come to him for it. We've got to ask and seek and knock. That's what he's going to tell us. Let's look at the next uh, set of verses. We're going to go from 7, 7 through 11. It says this. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more, remember last week we talked about arguments, a fortiori arguments, if this is true, how much more is this true? How much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? And then the last part of that we'll get to. Um, Lord willing, next time. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. You want to know how to follow Jesus? 
You want to know how to hold grace and truth in godly tension? You want to know how to have discernment over who to give pearls to and who not to give pearls to? You want to know how to live righteously and desire righteousness and desire the kingdom of God? you got to ask for it. you got to seek it. you got to knock on the door and keep on knocking. This is, these words in the Greek are in this present tense idea. It's not ask. It's keep on asking. Keep on seeking. Keep on knocking. That's what the life of a Christ follower looks like. If you want these things, you want to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. You want the gifts of the Father. Listen, you are not alone. For anybody who feels lonely or feels like they're alone, if you are in Christ, you have a Father who wants to give you good gifts. You don't have to spend another second, not another day, not another instant Thinking of yourself as trying to do it by yourself. Thinking of yourself as having to live by yourself. God loves you. God is with you. It's the point of Jesus coming. It's always celebrating Christmas. God with us. He understands you. He wants to give good gifts to you. You have to ask and seek and knock. And keep on asking and seeking and knocking. God will give you the good gifts. You don't ever have to fear about being turned away. What does it say? Everyone who asks receives. Those who seek, find. Those who knock, it will be opened. There's not a, there will be some who will knock and ask and seek, and I'm going to be like, no thanks. We're closed. And when the judgment comes, there's no more asking, seeking, and knocking. But until then, ask and seek and knock. And you will find, you will get what God has for you. But our tendency when we ask is to not necessarily ask for the right stuff. What did they ask for? Bread. Bread, 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 bread. Give me bread. I'm hungry. Like, well, I've got the words of eternal life. Mm, Bread. Right? I don't get it. So we can't be that way we got to seek first the kingdom of God. He's just told us this. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. You want bread? That's gravy. Or gravy. You want gravy? That's also gravy. <laughs> you want bread? You want clothes? You want the things you need that, that just to live, just to keep your body going? That's, that's gravy. That's extra. That's something he knows you need that. Seek first the kingdom of God. And his righteousness, that's what you're asking and seeking and knocking for. I'm not saying don't ever pray that you can pay the electric bill. You got an electric bill, you see paid, pray about it. Talk to the Lord about it. But that's not the primary passionate thing we're seeking in life is just to make sure we have the things to be comfortable. We're seeking eternal truth. We want pearls. We want more. We want more truth. Not stuff. That's not what we want. That's what bread seekers go after. That's what people who don't understand what pearls are go after. There are those who think that the highest thing that God has to offer is money and a new car or a better car and the health of their loved ones and whatever. Those are all good things. There's nothing wrong with money or nice cars or health. Those are all good things. But those are not eternal things. Those are not the things of the kingdom of God. It is upside down to have your primary interest in those things. That's what's upside down. What's right side up is to be asking and seeking and knocking after the eternal things. That's what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be asking for God's will on earth as it is in heaven. All of what he's been saying here is teaching us, going, moving into this part of what we ought to be asking for, what we ought to be seeking, what we ought to be knocking on the door for. Because you need a lot more than electricity and some clothes and whatever. You need Jesus. You need God. A lot more than the pleasures of this world, but it seems like we get kind of caught up in the other thing. James says this, and, or writes this in James Chapter 4, this is the second part of verse 2 and verse 3. It says, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. That's what our prayer life looks like sometimes, if we're honest, if I'm honest. It's, God, I need this, I need that, temporal stuff. 
I need this to work out, I need that to work out. If that's the primary aim of my prayers, I'm missing something pretty important. If I'm not asking and seeking and knocking for the kingdom of God and his righteousness and more Jesus, more Jesus, the deeper things of God, the deeper things about who he is, the deeper things about who I am in him, the deeper things about what we are and who we are in eternity, living that eternal life. Now, if that's not what my prayers are focused on and it's all temporal, then no wonder I don't feel like I'm growing if I do that. No wonder we're not seeing the kind of transformation we need. We're not asking for it. We're not seeking it. We're not passionate about it. And so we don't see it. God gives us good gifts because he's good. Not because we're good, because he's good. And he knows what we need. Because a, a good father knows how to give good gifts, right? We're, not even, we're broken people. And even we, if I gave everybody a test in this room, if your child asks for, a, asks for bread, should you give him A, bread, B, a stone? I'm guessing everybody's going to get it right, right? You should probably give him bread. Stone's not going to do much good for him if he needs bread. We even get that. Even we who are evil get that. If we get that, how much more does God get what we really need? I've got two kids, wonderful children, and they ask me for things sometimes, and I would love to give them the things that they ask for. I really would. But if they came to me and said, Dad, give me all the money in your bank account, I would say, no, because you know what? They don't need it, and it wouldn't be good for them. They might ask for it, but they're asking to miss. I mean, what are they going to do with a dollar thirty-four, right? <laughs> I should probably check that real quick. You know? <laughs> they don't need those things, right? Same thing with God. You ask him for things that you don't need and that wouldn't be good for you, don't be surprised when he says no because he's a good father. You ask him for the things that are in his will, you better believe he's going to say yes. You ask him for the things that are the best for you, do, do the things that are the best for me. I guarantee you he'll do them. He's promised that he will. Those things just may not be temporal pleasures, which the world seeks and the bread seekers seek. That's what they want, right? What do we want? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. We want you, Jesus. We want to be passionate about you. He's teaching them by giving them the loaves and fishes that they should be seeking the spiritual side of that, not the temporal side of it. And they couldn't get it in their heads, and sometimes we don't either. But if we love Jesus... We will ask, and we will ask, and we will ask, and we will seek, and we will seek, and we will seek, and we will knock, and we'll knock, and we'll knock. And ask for his truth, ask for relationship with him, ask for closeness with him. That's what we will do. Remember earlier I said that persistent seeking is the mark of a person of passion? Persistent seeking is the mark of a person of passion. That's how you know that you got a passionate person in your hands, because you see them seeking persistently. If you love someone or you love something, you're passionate about it, you are seeking, seeking, seeking. You don't stop. You won't stop until you get it. Listen to what Jesus says. This is a parable he tells in Luke 18, 1 through 8. Then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart, saying, there was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, get justice for me for my adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward, he said within himself, though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her. Lest by her continual coming, she weary me. Squeaky wheels get grease, folks. It's the way it is. Then the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said. And God, and shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him? It's another a fortiori argument. If an unjust judge will do this, how, how much more will God give to those who persistently seek him? Though he bears long with them, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Will he find faith on the earth? If you believe, believe in faith that God will do what he says he will, and that he will give you pearls, the most valuable thing in the universe, that he will give you his wisdom, his truth, and himself, if you believe that, 
wouldn't you be praying for it all the time? If I gave you a, 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 a genie lamp, you all have seen Aladdin or whatever, right? Oh, no. I won't do the whole thing. Anyway, <laughs> probably owe Disney money now. Um, <laughs> if I gave you a lamp, right, and told you, you rub this thing, there's a genie, all your wishes, you get it. If I came to your house the next day, I doubt that the lamp would be back in the corner somewhere. Oh, yeah, I forgot all about that thing. It'd be right here. You want something to eat? Bread. Right? You would be wishing. Why? Because you knew you would be getting something. So you'd be all over it. God has told you, I'm your father. I will give you what you need, and I love you, and I will give you good gifts. How much time are you spending going to him? You got a lot more than a genie lamp. Genies aren't real, but the God of the universe who created everything and created you specially and has told you how much he loves you and died for you, he's real. And you can be with him all the time. What have we found in our lives that's so much more important? Temporal pleasures, bread, whatever that may be in our lives. Something to think about. Will he find faith on the earth? Because faith means you believe that he'll do for you, which means you'll be asking, you'll be seeking, you'll be knocking. How long do you think we prayed for this building? For those of you who have been around for a while and with Acts Church, you would know. Many people prayed for a long time, prayed, fasted, met together, went to the Lord. And what did we say? Your will be done. And if you want us to have a building, you know we want one. So if it's within your will, we ask that you give it to us. And we trust your timing. But sooner would be better. Those were our prayers. And we sought diligently. We were passionate about having a place where we could worship God together, where we could study the word together, where we could meet together as the body of Christ. And we were passionate about that. And because we are passionate about that, we sought it out. We used to meet on Tuesday nights. And we wouldn't eat all day Tuesday. And we'd meet on Tuesday nights, and we'd pray that night, and then we'd eat together, right? Because we were seeking God, because we believed and had faith that if we sought him, he would be faithful. And look around, he is. He is faithful. He will do what's in his will. We had nothing Acts Church, prior to this merger, was not going to all of a sudden have the millions of dollars that it would take to buy a property. Yet we talked like we were going to have one because we believed it was God's will. That's what faith looks like. Will he find faith on the earth? You bet he's going to find it right here. That's who we are going to be. We as Christ followers are going to be people of faith. That means we're seeking. We are seeking. We want to know Jesus more and more. If, if, if there was a persistence before Tiffany and I got married. She had to persistently seek me <laughs> over a long period of time, asking and asking until she finally wore me out. She, she was going to wear me out with her continual coming, right? No, that's not true. I sought her. You probably figured that out. She also has eye problems, but that's a <laughs> different issue. She had to be persistent about it. No, I did. And I'm persistent about it now because I love her. I'm persistent about seeking relationship with her. I put time and effort and energy into it, right? Because I love her. My kids, I persistently seek time with them. Why do I do that? Because there's a million other things they have to do. Friends, video games, whatever, right? I'm boring. They've got computers now. But if I want relationship, i got to persistently seek it out. That's what we do if we want relationship. We seek it out, and we're persistent, and we don't give up, and we don't get lazy. We don't lose the passion of our first love for Jesus. I have a friend in law school who was all about this girl that we went to law school with. And she was okay with him. They were friends, right? But he was in love with this girl. She, not so much. And then, slowly but surely, over time, he wore this girl down. <laughs> they got married. They have a great marriage. They have kids, whatever. But he had to be incredibly persistent. He had to be incredibly persistent. And he was. That's what it looks like. That's what it looks like to be persistent. We don't take God for granted. We ask and we keep asking. We seek and we keep seeking. We knock and we keep knocking. And if that's not what our lives look like, we need to reassess whether we're living right side up or upside down. If the only thing you prayed about this week was, God, help me find my keys, I'm late for work. 
You should pray to find your keys when you're late for work. I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. But if that's the only thing you prayed about, something is backwards. Which is why sometimes God puts us in situations where we have nothing else and we have to rely on him because those are the only times, sometimes for us, that we'll really rely on him. How about I don't want to be in those situations? So maybe I should start praying and asking and seeking, knocking regularly. So he doesn't have to put me in situations to draw me back to him in those difficult ways. We need to be persistent to get the things we passionately desire. We need to passionately seek the things of God. Love, faith, peace, his strength, fulfilling work in his kingdom. That we passionately want to be better servants, better ministers to our brothers and sisters and to the world. These are the things we should passionately want. As far as bread and clothes and the rest of it, we should want those things only so far as we need them. If God wants to provide, and he does. Some people, some people have a lot more things than other people. And God's blessed them with that because he's expecting them, has an expectation they're going to be good stewards of those things for his kingdom. Right? Not that they're going to live off of 100% or 120% of what they have and never give anything to him. And then some of us might have less. Right? But we, but we just need what we need. We can trust him for that. we got to seek diligently the big things, the pearls. That's what a transformed and transforming life looks like. We need to be attracted to God. We need to want him. We need to seek him. And if we do, we will find him. Let's not be a people who love the bread that perishes. And that's all we can think about. Let's not be those people, right? Because eventually that person just turns into dogs and pigs that can't even see the value of a pearl. Let's be people who seek first the valuable things. That's what right side up looks like. First the valuable things, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, relationship with Jesus, a desire to be a servant, a desire to see the kingdom move forward, a desire for the eternal, recognizing that this is very temporary. Some of you have been around a long time, I can tell. But it's very temporary compared to eternity. Let's keep an eternal mindset and seek those things. Let's be a church. Let's be the body of Christ here that is truly looking to the future, that people might look at us and say, these people are passionate. They are people of passion. And how do I know? Because they seek Jesus and they seek Jesus and they seek Jesus. Their words don't even matter anymore. I don't need them to preach to me. They're preaching to me with their life. That's who we need to be. We want to draw people to know him, fulfill the Great Commission, make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teach them to obey all that he's commanded. Then we better start desiring that, asking for it, seeking it, knocking on the door over and over and over. Let's be that church. Let's be those people. Let's pray.